Good evening. I'm Father Tom Malionic, Director of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Kinderhook, New York. Today is Maundy Thursday, April 9th, 2020. It is Thursday in Holy Week. And we're gathered here for the Office of Vespers. The office this evening is, um, is somewhat abbreviated. Uh, according to the custom of the church in the West for many centuries. Um, if you do have a Book of Common Prayer and you would like to follow along, what you really need today are just the Psalms for this evening, which are Psalm 142 and 143, and those begin on page 798. Or you're welcome simply to listen, and you might just discover that God is speaking to you. Uh, but before we begin, let's take a moment, um, and I would I need to do this myself, Take a moment and make sure that the cell phone ringer is off um, and that you've minimized your other distractions and, and interruptions if, as best you can. Uh, if there's someone you'd like to invite to join you, please do so. Um, and we'll take a moment before we, uh, before we begin just to um, allow God to still our minds and our hearts. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Psalm 142. I cry to the Lord with my voice. To the Lord I make loud supplication. I pour out my complaint before him and tell him all my trouble. When my spirit languishes within me, you know my path. In the way wherein I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. I look to my right hand and find no one who knows me. I have no place to flee to, and no one cares for me. I cry out to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry for help, for I have been brought very low. Save me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. When you have dealt bountifully with me, the righteous will gather around me. Lord, hear my prayer, and in your faithfulness, heed my supplications. Answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for in your sight shall no one living be justified. For my enemy has sought my life. He has crushed me to the ground. He has made me live in dark places like those who are long dead. My spirit faints within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the time past. I muse upon all your deeds. I consider the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul gasps to you like a thirsty lamb. O Lord, make haste to answer me. My spirit fails me. Do not hide your, pla your face from me, or I shall be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear of your loving kindness in the morning, for I put my trust in you. Show me the road that I must walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord, for I flee to you for refuge. Teach me to do what pleases you, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring me out of trouble. Of your goodness, destroy my enemies, and bring all my foes to naught, for truly I am your servant. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the 14th chapter, the 12th through the 25th verses. 
and on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Here ends the reading. Christ, for our sake, became obedient unto death. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By long-standing tradition in the Western churches, Lent ends now with Vespers on Monday, Thursday. Uh, for many years, in fact, it has been the practice that only those who are not taking part in um, the Monday Thursday Eucharist later in the evening uh, would celebrate Vespers, would, uh, would say the office of, of evening prayer on this day. Uh, in parts of the church, and still, I suspect, in many parts of the church, um, a lot has already happened today. In some places, uh, this morning, there would have been a a chrism mass in our diocese we distribute that and do it earlier in the week so the bishop can can be personally present both in in three different parts of the diocese so that everybody can attend but uh, in many places where the bishop is more centrally located and the diocese is smaller in geographic extent that mass takes place on thursday morning and and that's where um, the oils the sacred oils are consecrated for use uh, during the rest of the year um, something only a bishop does and those oils are then distributed to the various parishes. Um, there's the oil of the sick, which is used in healing, the oil of catechumens, which is used in exorcism and in blessing those who are preparing to leave behind a life of unbelief and to um, enter into the fullness of life as, as Christian believers in baptism. Um, that oil is also consecrated at that mass. And then holy chrism, which is the um, the oil with which uh, everyone is anointed in baptism. Uh, in some places, it's where we are anointed again in confirmation, and in, uh, it's also used in the ordination of, of priests. In some places, again, lots of stuff goes on on Monday, Thursday. In the afternoon, penitents, uh, people who, by reason of serious sin, 
uh, are not eligible to receive Holy Communion. Um, that was more common in the day before there was uh, face to there, before there was um, auricular confession, confession in private to a priest. Um, when penance was public, was a public matter, uh, just as sin is always a public matter, even when it's uh, out of sight of everyone. Uh, but people who, by reason of serious sin, were uh, penitents, they had been cut off from a full communion with the church. They were not allowed to receive the sacrament of, of communion. They sat in a different place in the church. Um, they were they were admitting publicly, not only to their sin, um, not only demonstrating remorse, but they were also demonstrating publicly their resolve, their, their change of heart, the fact that they had realized that they had lost something very precious and very important, that they wanted back so much that they would be willing uh, to undergo some public humiliation in order to, in order to demonstrate how important it was to them to be back in communion with the rest of the church. And that, again, that took place on Holy Thursday in the afternoon, at least again in, in parts of the Western church. Um, that would have been done by the bishop again, readmitting them to communion so that they could participate once again as full members of the church in the celebration of the, the days to come. And in some places um, this evening, uh, there will still be a, a full Holy Eucharist of Maundy Thursday. It will still be done. There will be washing of feet. Um, there will be uh, a festive Eucharist. There will be a, a procession with the reserved sacrament to an altar of repose. The sacrament will have been consecrated fresh this evening. Uh, all of the reserved sacrament would have been consumed yesterday so that there was nothing left. And the sacrament of, of Christ's body and blood would have been freshly consecrated today because this is the day on which we use that gospel um, in at least Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's the day on which the day of preparation, the day before the, uh, the Passover meal, you know, when Jesus, um, or at least the eve, the eve of Passover, the, the dates are kind of kind of tricky, but that's the time. It's, it's that opening Passover meal or that opening meal in the day of preparation that that Jesus institutes the sacrament of his body and blood um, in Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. And so for many centuries, that has been commemorated with, with particular solemnity on Maundy Thursday. And so the, the, um, the Eucharist is, is splendid. There is, because Lent is over now, so there's music and, and the sacrament is then taken to a, an elaborate altar of repose, just as Jesus was taken after he leaves the table after the Last Supper, he leaves the table and he goes out to the Mount of Olives. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's arrested and taken. So his body and blood are, are placed for safekeeping uh, on a separate altar in a different place. For us, we, we set that up in the McNary Center. We take the sacrament out of the church in, in most years and bring it over to the McNary Center. This year, we have set up a, an altar of repose where we have had the Holy Eucharist um, exposed uh, in the monstrance for Eucharistic adoration. And there will be a video um, that we will play of that. It will be available all night from eight o'clock this evening on. Um, you can view it on our YouTube channel and you can um, get to it, I'm sure, from Facebook. We'll try to put a link up on Facebook as well. Uh, but the custom has been for people to keep watch through the night. Jesus asked his disciples to, could they not watch with him one hour while he prayed? Um, and so it has been the custom for people to stand guard over Jesus um, during, this, during this time when he is taken away from us, when he's isolated from us, when he's separated from us. Uh, and I know a lot, of, a lot of parishes will do that. And at the end of that service, the altar is stripped. The presence of Jesus is gone. And so the altar is stripped, just as Jesus was stripped of his clothes uh, to await the events, the unfolding of the events in the coming days. So tonight, a lot of parishes will offer that kind of a celebration and it will be live streamed. And if you wanna watch something like that, there's plenty of places to find it. I put one link up to the, to the Cowley Fathers uh, are putting up their 
Holy Thursday, your full Holy Thursday Eucharist, and I'm sure it will be it will be beautiful. And we'll get a link up to that, but um, that will be available as well if you want to do that. And other parishes will doubtless celebrate a, a Eucharist for um, on Saturday evening, uh, the the first Eucharist of Easter, uh, with the vigil, and then others will pick up again on Sunday morning. We're not going to do that here. Um, and that's not because I think it's wrong to do mass online or anything like that. Um, but it's really, well, for a couple of reasons. One, we can't do it all that well. And this is something that deserves to be done very, very well. So I would leave it to those who can do it powerfully. Um, because the Eucharist really isn't just about us getting together with our friends. Um, it really is about us joining together with Christ. And it is about us allowing the, the power and the solemnity of that event 2,000 years ago to really smack us square in the face. Um, and we don't have the technological means or the, at least in my case, the expertise to carry that off. There are others who can do it better. And if you want that this evening, you, you are welcome to it and you can have that. But there's, there's another, another reason um, for us not to do that. And that is because it does, I think, kind of dilute what we do. It says, oh, the important thing here is for us to see a few sights and hear a few words. Um, and that's really not all that it's about. It's about bringing our whole being. It's about bringing our whole person to this. Um, and I can see that may be better than nothing to be able to watch it. But I'm afraid that, that it does sort of give the impression that, oh, I can just watch a mass on TV or if I can just watch a service streamed live on Facebook, that somehow that's just as good. Um, it may have to do for now, uh, but I do think that we miss something out of that. And the third reason is that we can't actually participate uh, in the receiving of Holy Communion together as the church. Um, and again, when I say together as the church, I don't mean just our little community here, but us in communion with the rest of the church. And so many people are, are unable to do that this evening that I think we do well to be in solidarity with them in, in isolation as well. Because what Jesus Christ did for us um, is too much to take in in a, a half hour broadcast or an hour long uh, streaming video. It was just too much. It took, it took him a lifetime to get to where he got to. It took him a lifetime to even get to Jerusalem in that final week. Um, it has taken the church 2,000 years still to, to absorb that, and we're still absorbing it. We're still processing it. We're still, still learning one generation after another what it means, and we're still passing it on from one generation to another. What he did for us was was too amazing and too mind-boggling for us to be able to, to just kind of suck the juice from, from it conveniently and then move on. It takes an eternity for us to live into the presence of God, and it takes a lifetime for us to acquire a taste for absorbing it. And we will never really finish. We have to do it over and over again, year after year, and each time we will notice something different and something new. And maybe that's the gift of this year not being able to do this in person, is that we will notice something new in, in the absence of the things that are otherwise the greater distractions. The events that we are recalling are intense, and there is so much symbolic resonance with, with all of the rest of, of Revelation, all of the rest that God revealed to and through the chosen people. And those resonances are, are ear-splitting. The symbolism is, is thick. There's light and water and bread and wine and sacrifices and, and, and lambs and plagues and slavery and liberation and fire and clouds and smoke, incense, darkness. Those are palpable sensory experiences. And the one thing, again, that's, that's missing for us this year are the crowds. There aren't any. I don't know if you've had this experience of, of watching TV, perhaps, and, 
and and watching an old movie, for example, and just to see somebody shake hands and kind of cringe now a little bit when you see that happen. So there's that there's that sense in which crowds are an important part of the symbolism as well. And this year we can't have crowds. Um, there are crowds all through Holy Week. It's it's a raucous crowd that welcomes Jesus into the city that makes him such a problem to the authorities to begin with. And the arrest and the trial of Jesus don't take place in some private setting with just a single Pontius Pilate and, and maybe a single executioner standing by. Jesus is convicted by a manipulated mob. And we have to do that over and over again. We have to re rehearse this. We have to revisit it over and over. And that doesn't mean that we're also on like some kind of cosmic hamster wheel that we just keep have to recharging the batteries every year. We're not Sisyphus. We're not condemned to just, you know, start over again from the same spot year after year. There is a goal. There is an end. We do make some progress, but it doesn't come at once. And we don't just simply confidently march toward it and are able to look back and, and see how much ground we've covered. If anything, we look back and we see how little ground we have covered. But we have covered ground. And the more important thing is that the one who leads us continues to cover ground and brings us along. So we look ahead. We look ahead starting tonight, but not ending tonight. Not as a standalone observance of anything, but as the beginning of the Paschal three days, the great three days, the Triduum. Today is, in a sense, the beginning of the end. There is an end coming, and this is the beginning of it. Uh, and I don't mean, again, that it's, you know, the beginning of the end of yet another week of, of unfairly... Um, demanding religious observances that really should be spaced out so that we can attend them conveniently and they won't conflict with the other pressing demands on our lives. Jesus Christ has the pressing demand on our life. And we know that we cannot and we do not make the choice to offer him everything that he deserves and everything that he asks for, our entire selves, our entire being. And that's part of the learning. And when it's the beginning of the end, it's not because it's the beginning of the end of preparations for, for a bright, happy holiday, if we can just kind of whistle our way through Good Friday and all of its dour, dismal symbolism. It's not that we're looking forward to, you know, um, pretty bright flowers and colorful eggs and bunny rabbits and chicks and baskets of chocolate. And don't forget the licorice jelly beans, they're important. Um, this year, our April 12th, the, the calendar date of Easter, is really only going to be a, a reflection, a paler reflection of the, the joy and the conviviality that we have had in years past. Um, what today is the beginning of the end of, it is the beginning of the end of, hopefully, the beginning of the end of denial. It's the beginning of the end of the conceit that we are basically good people and that all we need is a little boost now and then. But basically we're doing the best we can and that's good enough. We need to overcome that delusion. We need to overcome that lie because it's what stops us from accepting the fullness of the salvation that Jesus Christ has to offer us. Today's the beginning of the end of the delusion that we can identify his good news because it makes it happy, makes us happy. And Lord knows we all need, you know, to be cheered up these days. But the good news is that we can have our, our whole lives revamped, refurnished, made new, polished off, cleaned up, started over on a new and better path, following the one who can really get us to our destination. Right? This, is, this is hopefully the beginning of the end 
in the sense that maybe finally now we will put down some of the attachments, some of the weight that makes us slow to respond to God's offer of, of forgiveness, of mercy and reconciliation that, that allows us to say, yes, these are my sins and I don't want them anymore. And Jesus, will you please take them away from me? And I will allow you to make changes in my thinking. I will allow you to make changes in the way I feel. I will allow you to guide me and to instruct me and to teach me and to make demands on me. And I will allow you to do that through the means you have provided. But I will allow that so that I can follow you better and so that I won't waste my time on things that are passing away. Now, this is the beginning of the time when we can begin to lay those weights down and, and instead of sort of, you know, half-heartedly reach out to receive, instead leap up to grasp God's offer of cleansing and, and freedom and liberation freedom to serve, freedom not to insist on being served. This is the beginning of the end of the fear that we will not have enough to sustain us or that we won't have enough of what we want to make us happy. This is the beginning of the end of loving the darkness. This is the beginning of the time when we can reach out toward the light and be filled with a light that is so bright that no darkness can overcome it. And take that light out into the world to dispel its darkness. This is the beginning of the end of sin that clings so closely. This is the beginning of the great observance that leads us to the observance of Easter again, to a deeper understanding of what the life is that Jesus is offering. Brothers and sisters, that's a lot. Uh, and it's a lot to try to organize. And I'm sorry I have not done a better job of organizing it. But it's, it's, it's trying to get this whole message that wants to just spill out. Um, because that's what's happening now. That's what's going on now for us. And we have... I think kind of the leisure now to be able to really ponder that and recognize it and make some real decisions in our lives to accept a different life from God, one that will truly be eternal and one that will truly take us as individuals and as the church, as our little church and as the wider church, more deeply into the presence of God, more deeply into the kingdom that that is coming into the world. Such as they are, those are my thoughts this evening. And I invite you to join in the celebrations, pay more attention to the words of scripture and the words of the prayer book than you do to mine, but, but do pay attention and, and let the grace of God touch you and move you and release you and set you free. And turn you inside out and fill you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty Father, whose dear Son on the night before he suffered instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.